Okay, so my name is Lily Winfrey, and I'm excited to talk to you all tonight. Well, it's tonight for me or whatever time it is for you. Um, I am the product owner for the Frictionless Data for Reproducible Research Project at the Open Knowledge Foundation. And I'm gonna be talking to you about some of the collaborations that we've done in the past with the idea that we can all together talk about how collaborations can be useful for things like open data management. So I'm gonna try and make this fairly interactive for you know a virtual online talk. So um, bear with me and I hope you are willing to participate. I have published these slides here at this bit.ly link in case you want to access them or look at them later. And this link is case sensitive. So it's bit.ly slash lowercase fd and then capital J Rost. And I do have lots of links in the slides, so um, you might want them. Okay, little intro outline. So as part of my goal to make this interactive, I thought it could be fun to have a little intro at the very beginning and ask you all to go into the chat and write a little bit about yourself, write your name and pronouns optionally, your field of study or research or work, and then your favorite planet. And I'm gonna try and bring up that chat so I can see your answers. Is anyone typing? Because I'm not seeing anything, but I'm concerned that I might have the wrong chat window open. Is there a separate chat for this session or is it all just the one chat? It is, um, the, the chat here is just for this session. So you're not sending it to everybody who's on Zoom. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. okay, cool, thank you. <laughs> We're just doing this in Zoom chat. I had that same question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't thought about a favorite planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oops, moved ahead accidentally. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, Jupiter is obviously the best. Though I guess we, I was trying to come up with an answer or a question that would be like everybody would have something to say and nobody would get in a disagreement. But then I was like, oh, maybe people are going to be mad about Pluto. <laughs> like <laughs> Maria still fighting for Pluto. Perfect. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. That's our first little exercise in trying to be um, trying to be interactive. And Caitlin, I can see your face. Can you give me a thumbs up if you cannot see the chat? Am I sharing the chat when I'm sharing my screen? It's just your it's just your face on the side and then your slides. Okay. Awesome, thank you. All right, so our outline today. We're going to talk about research data management and reproducible or reusable data. We are going to be talking about frictionless data. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of an intro and then I'm gonna start talking about our collaborations and our pilots and you know what they are, why they work, why we do collaborations like this and focus on one use case, which is Beco Demo, which is oceanography data. And so during the Beco Demo part, I'm gonna be talking more and then it's gonna be a little bit less interactive, but um, I'm just going to try and make this pretty interactive and have discussions throughout. And if you have a question, I'm going to try and keep the chat open so you can ask me that question and hopefully I will see it. Okay, the next thing is this talk. <laughs> Anytime that I have a gif of a dog, that is our cue that we are going to be interacting together and using the chat. So just <laughs> that's, that's what we're doing. Okay, so the first thing for us is I want everybody to go to this bit.ly link, and this is different than the first one because of the capitalization. This is going to take us to a spectrogram. So it's capital FD, lowercase j Rost. And I will oops, show you where this goes. This is a spectrogram exercise that we are all going to do together. And I'll give everybody a minute to get there. So a spectrogram is a 
well, it's this basically, we are, it's a statement and then you talk about where you fall on the spectrum of that statement. So this is an example. Um, and so I have made a statement here, which is a good day should always start with a croissant. And then step two is that everybody is going to create a post-it note with their name on it and position yourself along the statement. And then step three is that I will call on people or ask for volunteers to explain your opinion. And you can make a post-it note by either clicking this note button here, or you can click on somebody's pre-existing note and hit these three squiggly buttons and hit duplicate. So I'll give people a minute to do that or 30 seconds to do it. Oh, and I should mention that I shamelessly stole these slides from my colleague Cedric. Uh-oh, did it disappear for everybody? It did. Uh-oh. <laughs> I think maybe somebody hit clear frame. Here's the thing <laughs> about this is that I actually don't know how to like undo things. Um, if, uh, hmm, hmm. well, you guys, this is a, an un, uh, unpredicted <laughs> outcome to this. Uh, I have no idea how to undo that. If Is anybody you... knows, if somebody accidentally hit clear frame, if you could hit the undo button, otherwise we can move on to the next one because this is just our fun example. Okay, I'm gonna assume that we can't get it back, but we can, I can still um, explain my position as if it's still up there. So I picked the, the far left side, which was agree with the statement that every day should start, every good day starts with a croissant because I love croissants. And every day that I have a croissant for breakfast is a good day. And then I don't know who picked something else. So I will not have you explain this time, but hopefully that is understandable enough for us to move on to our next example. And then let's all participate on this one again. So our statement here is all non-human or private research data should be openly shared. So again, create a sticky note, either by hitting the sticky note button here or clicking on an existing sticky note and hitting duplicate and position yourself along this line of do you agree with the statement that all non-human or private research data should be openly shared? Do you disagree? Do you fall somewhere in the middle? Again, we'll do like 30, 45 seconds to get people going. having some consensus in an area that I predicted we would be having consensus in. There seems to seem. All right, Daniela, can I call on you to give us a 30 second explanation for your position on this spectrogram? I assume that it means that any data that doesn't have concerns about it being released ethically and legally, then I would say that everyone should have access to that for reproducibility, but for justice and equality and how it was funded and we, everyone should have access. Thank you. Adrian, do you have additional thoughts to add? You're a little bit farther to the middle, so I'm not sure if that means that you are you don't agree or disagree? And what I you think it depends. Um, you know, there are different types of research data and there might be um, kind of 
personal information in there. So um, I, I really think that um, it depends. At first, I thought, yeah, I agree. But then when I saw the word private, and then I thought, well, maybe it really depends. So that's why I moved myself to further to, um, to the right. Yeah, thank you. I think I agree a little bit more with you, Adrian, on that one. I think that it's that private means different things to different groups of people, different populations. And so I think it's important to make sure that we think about that before sharing. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next one. So our next statement is most published research data is usable and understandable. And so again, oh, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, move, you move by clicking this button here. So we're on the third one now and please create another sticky note and put yourself where you agree with that statement. <laughs> again, I expect that we'll have some consensus on this one, but it's good to hear people's thoughts. And let's see, Maria, since you're the farthest over towards disagree, would you mind uh, if I call on you to ask for your thoughts here? <laughs> sure. I, I didn't really mean to be like the farthest one out there for any <laughs> like defined intentional reason. Um, but I, you know, I think most research data isn't really, I guess I was, at first I read it and I was thinking reusable, which is different than usable. But um, so yeah, when I put myself over there, I was, in my mind, I was translating that as reusable, which we know is not the case, so. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, I think it definitely, I think reusable definitely falls into the statement, but um, yeah, I also agree with your statement that it's not necessarily the same thing. And then Sheila, you're kind of in the middle. Would you mind? giving your response to this, please. Sure, yeah. Um, so I definitely have not seen all of the research data that's out there. So my scope is very limited to research data that I have come across or been exposed to. Um, so I can't really agree or disagree with, with the statement. Um, I think it will also just depend and I'm not in a position to make a judgment one way or the other, which is why I put my sticky note in the middle. Because I'm sure there's some research data out there that is very usable and understandable and then there's some that is not. And I am not aware of every single piece. So I am refraining from making a judgment. Definitely, yeah. I hear that. Okay, thank you, Sheila. All right, I'm gonna move us on to our next one, which is irreproducible or irreplicable. I'm just binning them in right now for this statement. Irreproducible research data is that way, is irreproducible because of bad intent. And again, you know, 30 seconds to get a sticky note and put it where you think it goes on the spectrogram. All right, Caitlin, I don't think that I've called on you yet. If you wouldn't mind, would you uh, please share your thoughts with us? Sure. Um, I'm also waiting to see where SJ lands. <laughs> He's like thinking about where to go. Um, so I, it, this one's tough just based on some of the wording. So I think that in some cases it is used as a sort of preventative manner, like deliberately obfuscating so that someone can't, you know, build on their work or, and we've also heard stories of, um, unfortunately, individuals who feel that it's so highly competitive 
for their work or contingent on their funding or tenure or this whole publisher parish side of things um, that they make the data um, more difficult uh, to have others use so that they have a competitive advantage. Um, there's also the reason I say it's complicated outside of just those dimensions is that it also feels just like the system failing has led to many of these things and those sorts of constraints, which um, there's a question in my mind as to where accountability and blame sort of lie in that regard. Definitely. Yeah, I think those are really good points. Um, Maria, do you mind if I call on you again? <laughs> to give us a different perspective? Sure, I just putting food in my mouth that time. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I'm always an optimist and I, I think most of the time it's, so there are certainly instances where I think people are intentionally obfuscating, but I think most of the time it's probably just, it takes a lot of work to make something, you know, really uh, reproducible and, and understandable. And I think that it's probably just not on people's it takes a lot of intentionality and work up front. So I just think people are probably not knowing what they need to do or not taking those steps, but not from a malicious or intentional standpoint, but just not making that effort. So I don't think it's, but then again, I'm, I'm also optimistic and this is also just a wild guess, yeah. so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, definitely. Okay, here's our last one, and then we'll get back to the rest of the presentation. So the statement is, teaching researchers data management practices will solve the reproducibility crisis. And again, make your sticky notes, put it where you think it should go. I like this one. I like we're a little bit more spread out, a little bit less sure, maybe. <laughs> Great, thank you. SJ, I don't think we've heard from you yet. Would you mind giving us your opinion here? Not at all. Uh, I was going to say earlier, I think most research is understandable to someone, and it's, it's a context question. And uh, and here, even the best data management doesn't solve the audience and context challenge. Um, unless you work in a field that has carefully described what reproducibility means so that anyone can come and satisfy themselves that they could reproduce work and get a similar result. Uh, it's gonna be very hard to match the the local context of the researchers with the context of people trying to confirm their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. And then maybe Adrian, have we heard from you yet? Would you mind volunteering to give us your opinion? Sure. Um, I think for this one, um, even though they know, I mean, the researchers, even though they know the importance of um, managing data, it doesn't mean that they will do it, or even if they do it, they may not do it well, just because maybe they don't have the experience or, um, you know, um, for somebody who is like a new graduate student, um, it takes time to accumulate uh, the experience of doing that. So just, I mean, teaching is one thing, doing is another, and also whether doing it well is yet another thing. So I think, again, you know, it's kind of like, it goes both ways, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think I agree with both of you in that, um, in both of your statements. Um, though I will say that trying to teach researchers data management practices is a lot of what I do and a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. and you know, the, the thing that we tell funders is that teaching these researchers these tools will help solve the reproducibility crisis. But in reality, I think it's much more complicated than that. So I really wanna thank you all for doing this with me. And I'm gonna go back to my slides now. 
and continue on with the presentation. Okay, so the work that I do is called the Frictionless Data for Reproducible Research Project. And I'm gonna give you a little bit more background about what that is now. So our goals are to remove friction in research data, to move from data to insight faster. We're completely open source and we're community focused, meaning that we rely on our community members to help us and to open issues and to ask for feature requests. And here's a link to our GitHub where you can see all of our project information. And I have a very small team and we work at the Open Knowledge Foundation on this project. So it's called frictionless data, but what are some frictions in data? And here we have our dog back with question marks to ask you all your thoughts on what are some frictions in data? So go ahead and write those in the chat if you have thoughts there. And of course I have lost the chat. So I'll try and pull that up again. Well, <laughs> if y'all have thoughts, um, and here I'll give you some suggestions as well, in case you don't have thoughts. For us, we think of friction um, as things like, what is this column name? How was the analysis done? Who created the data? And checking data quality. So it's things that you need to understand to be able to use the data. Let me see if I can get that chat again. Okay, there it is. Okay, so I'm reading your answers now. Large data set access, lack of metadata, definitely, interoperability issues, misaligned vocabulary, schemas, provenance. Yes, all of these things can count as frictions. So what is frictionless data? How do we work to get rid of these frictions? It is a suite of specifications for data and metadata interoperability open source software libraries. It's a range of best practices for data management. And importantly, it's platform agnostic, so it should be very, very interoperable. And so this project, we're really focused on how can researchers use frictionless data to help them make their data more usable. And no worries, Maria, you can head out. Thanks for coming by. Okay, so this next question I want to talk about is how can we collaborate to solve research data management problems. And to do that, we are working as part of this project in three different ways. So this project is funded by the Sloan Foundation and part of our funding is to do three types of collaborations. The first one is pilots, which I'll go into more details about later. We also have a tool fund and a fellows program and each of these collaborations focuses on different set of users or a different set of stakeholders and they all have different needs. So our fellows are early career researchers and they're just beginning their experience with open science and data management. And so we work with them to teach them and to build community and really build advocates for open science and for using our frictionless tooling. Our tool fund is where we work with developers to create new open source tools for open science that are based upon our open source tooling. And then our pilots are where we work with researcher groups in a very collaborative way to actually help them solve a research data problem that they have identified. And so the pilot that typically works where our developers and our team work with another group's team or developers and it work to integrate our code and it can either be integrate our code with their code or you know create a new piece of software that's built upon our code to solve some sort of problem. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And one of the things I want to say about pilots is that they're really useful for three reasons. Well, more than that, but three that we're going to talk about today is that you can use them to test. So test your code, test your solution, see if it works. Get then, or you can get lots of feedback, which is really important for us. And ideally, we're also solving a researcher's problem. Okay, so I wanna ask you again, now if you or your projects have any kind of collaboration that is, sounds similar to any of these, or if you collaborate in a way that sounds different than any of these, if you could type that in the chat. 
because I think it's really interesting to hear from people to hear like, you know, are there certain types or categories of collaboration that you think are particularly useful? Or different like stakeholders that um, you think are useful. Like for instance, we don't really work with funders at all and maybe we could. Okay, I'm gonna move on because I'm a little worried about time, but if you think of something, put it in the chat. Okay, I'm gonna tell you more about our pilot with Bico Demo. So Bico Demo is the Biological and Chemical Oceanography Data Management Office, and they are primarily funded by the NSF, so they're a, a US organization. And the way they work is that scientists submit data to Bico Demo, and then Bico Demo has data managers that clean that data and get it ready to be hosted, and then they provide data access to the public and to other researchers. And so Bico Demo had an identified problem with their current data management system, and we decided to work together as a pilot to help resolve this. So to begin to understand the problem that they had, I want to show you some of their data. Bico Demo data is very messy, and it is you know all sorts of oceanography data. So there's things like the salinity of the ocean or like jellyfish biology data. But there are things as well, like you can see here, um, this is a column of dates, but it's our date range. And the dates are written in like a non-standard format. Like it's probably how Americans write it, but you know, no one else really. So there's some issues with this data. And the Beaker Demo data, ma data managers needed help cleaning this data in a reproducible way. So I wanted to ask you really quickly if anybody has heard of Bico Demo before, or if they've submitted their data there, or if you have submitted your data to a different repository, and if you've submitted your data, have you gotten feedback from the data managers as you are submitting your data? And if you're on the other side, if you're a data repository, have you given feedback to researchers as they've submitted their data? and any issues that maybe you've come across in that. So if you have anything, put it in the chat. Daniela loves the Bico Demo team. Me too, they're amazing. <laughs> yes, and anytime that you're exchanging data between different systems, that can be difficult. All right. So what did we do together? We wanted to go from messy data to clean data that can then be hosted, right? Sounds simple enough. But importantly, we wanted to do this in a way that it would be reproducible and understandable for others. So the solution we came up with was to create a frictionless data processing pipeline. And I'm gonna break this down to some steps and then go over how frictionless worked for this. So there are things that the Beaker demo, demo data managers needed to know, such as what is this data? Does the data seem valid? Like, are there any missing values or values that don't make sense? Does the data need to be transformed or cleaned? And how can this process be transparent and reproducible? And importantly, we wanted to be able to get feedback to the researchers as they're submitting their data, because you know they're very busy. You can't really contact them and be like, did you record your metadata? So we're gonna go through these things. Oops, wrong way. Okay. We're gonna go through these things and talk about how frictionless can be used to solve them. So the first step is what is this data? And to understand data, you need to document the metadata. And here's some raw data. And we have our dog here to show you that I would like for you to participate and what are some things about this data that it would be helpful to understand? Like, what is some of the missing metadata from this data set? Yeah, location, it's a great one. There's also things like, what is cond? 
yeah, what are the conditions referring to? What is temperature measured in? Exactly, what are the units? So BCODEMO, when they receive data, it typically has a lot of rich metadata with it. And this data has this nice metadata associated with it. So you can see things like temperature is in degrees Celsius and um, you know other definitions for this data that help us understand it. So how do we capture this data and make sure that we aren't losing it when researchers are submitting their data? The way that we do this with frictionless is called the data package. And the data package is one of our core specifications. And you can think of it like a box that contains your data and your metadata and optionally a schema to further describe the data. You're kind of like containerizing your data and the metadata together. I'm not gonna go over this in a lot of technical detail, but here are links to where you can see the full specification and also our code to create and use data packages. I am gonna show you just really quickly our data package creator, which is our user-friendly browser tool where you can load raw data. So for instance, you could take this data set, load it into this browser tool and automatically infer the metadata associated from that raw data. So um, that's what I'm showing you here. The data package creator tool has automatically inferred the header names, things like the data type, and then it puts it in JSON. And you can also edit and add more metadata like licensing and um, version number, for instance. And I wanna mention that this is in JSON because we really were trying to optimize for machine readability. We also um, have support for YAML though, if that works for you. So this is a tool that um, if you're interested sometime I could do a demo with you, but we also have uh, more information here in these links. Okay, so the next question we wanted to look at with BicoDemo is, is the data valid? And we have our dog here, so I'm going to ask you if you can put in the chat if you have a favorite data validation story or horror story. My favorite data validation horror story is how Excel will, it will convert names of genes into dates and accidentally mess up analysis for gene research. Um, is just like horrible and terrible. So I'm wondering if anybody has experienced their own data invalidation horror story, or even has like worked with Excel and had Excel change your data types without telling you. And if nobody has a data invalidation story, I'm gonna be impressed. Oh, okay, Kaylin has zip codes. Mm -hmm. Are you, yeah, yeah. I will admit that I actually didn't know that there were zip codes that had a leading zero until about a year ago when I was working with some and had that problem. Yeah, Boston. Yep. <laughs> yes, Alexander, the recent UK government with the COVID tracing. Yes, that is a very good horror story. Okay, so to avoid horror stories like that, we have a data validation which is called frictionless validate. And the way that works is, um, well, I'll show you here with this toy data example. So by eye, we can see this toy data set has some issues, like we have an empty row, we have repeated column names, and maybe like a missing value and extra values. So with frictionless, this is our command line tool. And you can type in frictionless validate and then the name of your CSV file and get out if it's valid or invalid. And here, this one's invalid. And then we have this message telling us exactly where the errors occurred. So for instance, we have the duplicated header, we have a missing cell, that blank row was picked up. And this can be really useful for when you have a large data set where you can't just see these errors by eye. And here's the link to our documentation where you can check this out in more details. So this is the um, command line tool. We also have Python library and a browser tool. 
So what does this look like with BCODEMO? For BCODEMO, we really wanted to try and validate the data as it's being submitted. And this was important so that we could you know, catch those researchers when they're working on the data. And here's an example where um, BicoDemo found a duplicated row in this data set. So row 133 is duplicated to row 115, which might have been hard to find by eye. And now that you have this error, you can go in and fix it or you know, tell the researchers like, hey, please fix this. And here's a link again to that validation and to the browser tool version of this, which is good for people that um, don't code, don't do any code. Okay, the final thing we wanted to work on with BicoDemo was, does this data need to be transformed or cleaned? And to do this, we use our code called data package pipelines, which are data processing pipelines. It's a Python framework for declarative processing of data. It includes standard data processing steps like joins and finds and replace. Um, it documents the metadata and creates a schema and outputs a data package. And importantly, all of these pipeline steps or data cleaning steps are defined in a file called, called pipelinespec.yaml. And inside this file, we have specified each of the processing steps, all of the execution parameters and it's in a human readable format so that anyone can understand what happened to that data. So this really helps with reproducibility. And the outcome of this pipeline is this pipeline, pipeline spec YAML file and a data package. Here's an example of what the BicoDemo pipeline tool looks like that their data managers use now. So each of these are different steps of this process. And we can look at the find and replace step, which here is looking at the time field and is finding this pattern and replacing it with another pattern. But what it really means is written in the notes, which is that they are finding, they are fixing an inconsistent time format because some didn't have seconds. And then in the pipeline spec.yaml file, all of this information is captured and it's in YAML, so it's pretty human readable. And uh, that's, really important for making this process reproducible. So to summarize this pilot collaboration that we did with BicoDemo, we were able to help their data managers go from messy data to clean data that has its metadata and schema documented and has a file telling us every data cleaning step that was done by the data managers. And all of this is open and accessible for other researchers to look at. Okay, so that is the end of my example, but I wanted to ask you all now, what are some other research data infrastructure problems or research data management problems that could be solved by a pilot type collaboration? And I'm really wondering, like, I want to kind of crowdsource some of your ideas or dream ideas about what problems could be solved by working together? And I don't specifically mean here like working with a frictionless team, though if you want to, that's awesome. Um, I don't want to limit it to that though. Like what are some other issues in this space or problems that you think groups could work on together in this kind of like intensive collaboration where you have funding and you have interest and like developers and researchers that can come in and work together. Anybody have any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, data and software connections, making things reproducible beyond data's reliance on articles I like that. Data repository, yeah, yeah. Um, so a slight spoiler here is that we are starting a new collaboration with Dryad, which is a data repository. And Daniela is from Dryad, so she could, I guess she gave a talk yesterday that you could hear more when it's um, published. But we are hopefully going to be working with them to solve their problems soon. Data modeling, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Caitlin, I think that's really interesting. Another, I mean, this is kind of out of left field, but another thing that I would like to really think about is the way that we publish research, research in articles. You know, how could we reinvent that? And I think eLife is doing some really interesting work there. Um, curious to see other people work on that. Documentation, definitely. Okay, you guys, I think we're almost out of time. So I'm gonna move to my thank you slide, which has a lot of links. Again, the links to these slides, which is, let's wait for that menu to go away, which is there um, and links to our GitHub, our Discuss forum, our Discord chat, which is our big community chat. Um, if you want to join our community, that's a great place to come in and ask questions. Um, our YouTube channel for open knowledge, where we have some tutorials and other talks about frictionless data and our guide. And then of course our Twitter. Um, and I wanna give a shout out that this Thursday, we have a community call where we will be having a community presentation. And that's at noon US, um, 5 p.m. UK. So probably bad time for anybody that is in Australia that we usually record those. So let's see if anybody has another question and you know, either chat or if you wanna unmute and ask me a question, that's fine with me as well. I have one, Lily. I know we are going to be going back into the main room soon, but I would love to know what you have found most challenging about this work. Yeah, that's a great question. I think overall, what's most challenging is like actually getting the researchers to change their habits. And, you know, we're kind of, we're talking about this at the beginning. Um, you know, you could teach people data management best practices, but in reality, getting researchers to implement that is hard. And I think there's a lot of reasons why it's hard. You know, they don't have time, they don't have incentives. And yeah, so I'd say that's kind of like that cultural change is the hardest thing. Yeah. I, so Sheila, I will say that I feel like people like ORCID or I feel like ORCID has done a really good job of getting, of maybe just making it so simple that people. Well, and also a lot of funders are requiring ORCID IDs and publishers require it. So it's like something you have to do, but we still hear a lot of complaints from people that don't wanna have to sign up for yet another, you know, they think of it as a profile. It's not actually a profile, it's a record. It's an interoperable record, but yeah, there's, there's been a lot of uptake, but there's still a lot further to go. <laughs> yeah, as you say that, I'm like, oh, like my orchid needs a little.